Thank you so much, Bill. Senator Bamakino, Under Secretary Adrian Cristobal Jr., Ms. Dori Magsay Saiho, all, uh, all the distinguished speakers, and all the honorable guests and colleagues and friends. First of all, my deep thanks for the organizers for really thinking that inclusive business merited a session of its own. And thank you so much for inviting me. I would like to just take you on a path of what inclusive business has gone through in the last few years and to hope that we will all together be able to take it into the future. So the first part that I wanted to describe is why we really care about inclusive business. We care because we have to look at a development process that includes everybody. And for the World Bank, our goals are to end extreme poverty, but also to go towards a more shared prosperity. The UN just came out with their sustainable development goals. They replaced the Millennium Development Goals and they have very specific targets. And of course, here for the APEC members, you have the goals to build a more, more inclusive economies and a better world. So what do we really mean by this inclusiveness? For one thing is, I think we have to look at people in low-income communities and people who don't have access to services not as beneficiaries of charity or philanthropy or corporate social responsibility, but full economic actors. They together are a $5 trillion market in terms of what they consume. They are the people who often provide services. They are not part of the economy officially, but in fact they are there and they are part of the whole economic growth that needs to take place. And I wanted to, before I get into the definitional part, I just wanted to go through a little bit of history, but I wanted to also answer uh, Ms. Doris Magsai Saiho that the size of the companies is not a problem. You can have inclusive business models in microenterprises, small enterprises, medium or large. So it really is not the size, but rather the mind frame as you well so put. What we really need to remember is that this mind frame actually came from Professor Prahalad, who has influenced many people, including myself, my colleagues, and many social entrepreneurs that I meet, and many inclusive business owners that I meet. And that was only in 2004. But it does not mean to say that inclusive business didn't exist. But the concept of looking at the base of the pyramid as, a, as an economic term, that just because people are poor, they don't participate in the economy, that book really did make everybody stop and think about it. Um, so we owe quite a lot to the late Professor Prahalad. And then uh, IFC, together with the World Resources Institute, came out with a more in-depth analysis well, what exactly is the size of this market? It's the base of the pyramid. It's quite a big percentage of the world population. And that was in 2007. I want to also mention that the UNDP came out with very good market-based solutions for the poor type, you know, uh, studies. And we ourselves at IFC have come out with case studies, really trying to look at exactly how do these businesses that incorporate the poor in their value chain operate. So we actually do have quite a lot of publications uh, and quite a lot of evidence. So I think that's the most important thing, that we're just not talking about, you know, what we wish it to be, but it is based on the truth. So what are we defining inclusive business as? And I can only speak from our experience. 
But what we're trying to say is that the private sector companies, in their own business models, they integrate the men and women at the base of the pyramid. And it really is something that is on all sectors. It is not just one sector or another. And more and more, we're including health, education, and some of the softer sectors that we didn't have at the beginning. We at IFC have come out with our own definition, and I'm sure people come out with other definitions. But we were able to, through quite a lot of hard work, together with the UNDP, at least have a kind of a working definition that the G20 members have accepted. And that is that inclusive business is a private sector approach to providing goods, services, livelihoods on a commercially viable basis, either at scale or scalable, to people at the base of the pyramid by making them part of the value chain of companies. But it has to be the core value chain of the company as suppliers, distributors, retailers, or consumers. We have enough evidence base to really show that companies that have this enlightened self-interest have looked at this and said, this is something where it really makes sense. This is one way that the private sector can really improve the lives of men and women from low-income you know, communities, this is one way for people to have the ability to get out of poverty. And it is not CSR. It is not just purely community engagement for the sake of engagement. It is something that makes business sense. So in terms of numbers, um, hold on one second. Here we go. Uh, in terms of numbers, we just want to tell you that it is not a small thing. This is, this is big. IFC has already invested over $12 billion. And this is when we started counting in 2005. We have over 450 companies throughout the world, more or less 90 countries. And together with our client companies, we have reached over 300 million people, either farmers, students, patients, utility customers, or microfinance borrowers. So we're really talking about an impactful way through the private sector, through companies, whether they're large, small, medium, this is what we're reaching. So it is something that we all have to think about in terms of the efficiency of development. And as we know, there is a huge gap uh, for the money towards development in the next few years. It's estimated to be very, very high. Uh, our next moderator will talk about that, but we have had all the multilaterals get together and really talk about finance for development. What are the needs? And the needs are huge. So this inclusive business model type finance is it seems large, but it actually, compared to the needs of trillions of dollars, it's just one piece of the puzzle. I wanted to just give you a very quick glimpse of what kind of sectors we are working in. Um, because we are a financing company, we are a bank, uh, we can do equity, we can do debt, but we really are a financing company it's normal that the financial markets are usually the way that we reach a lot of the private sector in emerging markets. So about 20% of what we do that goes directly to impact the poor in microfinance, microinsurance, and low-income housing, finance, that kind of financial type of company. But we also do a lot in telecoms. We invested heavily in cell phones in Africa at the very beginning. Um, one of the sectors that has always been important for inclusive business is agribusiness because being able to reach, you know, small farmers and get them into a larger value chain is one of the ways to get farmers out of poverty. H having said that, we also have health, education, infrastructure, manufacturing. So in all the sectors that uh, the IFC 
he is working in, we do have projects that have inclusive business models. And we're also geographically uh, quite dispersed. We are a global um, financial arm of the World Bank for the private sector, so we do have Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, East Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and it's pretty much evenly distributed. So inclusive business is not necessarily one regional play. It's pretty much throughout our own portfolio. We have certain sectors, though, that we see more models that have come through. And as I said before, agribusiness, procuring crops from smallholder farmers, or selling inputs to smallholder farmers. Education. We have really increased our activities in trying to get affordable education and vocational education. In health, affordable health care is something that is very much needed. We have housing, affordable housing. Again, in many countries, it is a bottleneck. And again, financial services, including mobile money. Mobile money especially has become uh, something that we are looking into more closely. And Finally, utilities. Still, one of the biggest issues is how do you get the last mile delivery of water and all types of uh, services. So just so we all are on the same page, inclusive business can happen in any of the sectors. As long as you are including the poor as your customer or if you're thinking of them as your supplier, that's, that could be an inclusive business. Well, let me share you some actual examples. It's a lot easier if you just have some ideas of what kind of clients that we're dealing with. Um, and the first one, as you already know, and it will be talked about later, is Manila Water. We invested very early on in Manila Water, and we continue to work very closely. Uh, I'm not going to repeat what's on the board, but you know, it is one of the mo most successful uh, privatizations and concessions in terms of the poor really being reached. And if you get a chance to go into our website, we have a very nice video about this lady called Maxima who sells chicken barbecues on the street and how her life changed because she now has tap water in her own home. The next example is from Mexico and it's about affordable housing for very low income people. We actually have a video on uh, this project also because it, this is a company that really sees that if you're low income, not only do you need a decent home, but you need a whole environment for your children to grow and they provide computers in these homes because it is almost as if, if you're gonna be a modern Mexican, you really need to be able to have access to technology. Very interesting company with very entrepreneurial uh, founders and they really see the housing service, not just selling a home, but when people get into a slightly higher income bracket, they can swap their starter home into slightly better homes. So they have a whole different view of looking at their clients. These are people that they want to have a relationship with for a long time. The next example comes from India, and it's one of our long-standing clients. We've been together for almost 15 years. The company actually wanted to sell drip irrigation to very low-income farmers because that way they can really improve their yield and they can get more uh, income. But it turns out that they're so poor that the company realized that they will first have to start buying from these farmers. And they came up with an idea and they created a whole business line of buying onions and mangoes. They dehydrate them and very quickly, Jane Irrigation, which was an irrigation, drip irrigation company, became one of the largest exporters of mangoes, dried mangoes and dried onions. And they were very clever because they knew that farmers have a tendency to side sell. So for the onions, they introduced a white onion variety, which people in India don't actually eat. They think it's like a garlic, so that the farmers really were 
you know, more than happy to bring back these white onions that they couldn't actually do anything with, and the company made sure that the farmers kept coming back to them, since the company actually invested in the farmers and uh, gave them capacity building. This was one way to avoid the side selling. Chain irrigation has actually trained uh, more than like three million farmers in the process of trying to really spread the use of drip irrigation. And they are happy to do that because they realize that at the end of the day, if they're gonna sell drip irrigation, they do have to do that type of training. Uh, it's a family owned business and they have the long term view of what it is that their company will be achieving. And they really are very much wedded to improving the lives of farmers and making them able to get better yields by using the drip irrigation. So it's kind of a, one of the interesting companies where the small holder farmer not only is a consumer of drip irrigation, but they can actually turn out to be a supplier of onions or mangoes. Finally, one of the uh, our more recent clients, but a very, very interesting one, Bridge Academies actually started out as a social enterprise, but very, very much from the beginning, they ran it as a business. And they are providing really low cost education to people who live in slums. And they're doing it by using technology, by being able to train the teachers using you know, iPads and so forth, and to be able to really look at each of the students' progress in a technological way so that the teacher just has to concentrate on teaching in the classroom, not about creating the you know, study, the courses, and this and that. They, they are given a lot more um, prepackaged course materials and also evaluation type materials. I think I, I chose this example because this is actually something that is a bit controversial because in some countries, primary education is still in the public sector, and there's a lot of teachers' unions and many um, people who were against this specific project. There was a lot of press um, saying, you know, it should not be in the hands of the private sector. Not only private sector, it's actually a foreign company. And as a foreign company, they actually get taxed at a much heavier rate. Um, regardless of all those impediments, the company is, is still growing and uh, is going to probably go from Kenya to some other countries in Africa. So perhaps this is an area, especially health education, where the private sector and the public sector have to have a better dialogue. If, because if at the end of the day, we're trying to provide low-income people with a better education, you know, there are things that the private sector can bring to the table. Now that I've given you like an overview of what IFC has found, again, from our own client base, we didn't invent inclusive business, these things existed. It was only that we decided at one point in time, you know, this looks very interesting, let's go deeply into our portfolio. And that was 2010, whoops. Let's see if we can go on to the next slide, but I will continue because uh, Okay. Well, the next slide is really on what we have been doing with the G20. Um, my colleague from the UNDP, Marcos Neto, is here, and he will probably say a few words later before he moderates the next session. But we have been working very, very closely together with the G20 for the last nine months or so. And the Turkish presidency came and asked to create a framework on inclusive business. And what is important to say is that the framework is very inclusive. We created a framework that takes into account all private sector actors that are doing some type of activity that actually impacts the lives of the poor. And what we accomplished in the nine months or so is to, first of all, really create an awareness in the G20 members um, about the private sector. We wanted to have at the call of the leaders 
this weekend, there will be a little brief notice saying that all the G20 countries should look into inclusive business as an important tool uh, to help alleviate poverty, and that we also were able to convince the G20 members that it would be worth having more policy dialogues between the private sector and the public sector, specifically on inclusive business. So those are two things that we fought for and we were happy to be able to, to get to that point. And uh, in order to do that, you can imagine there were 19 countries plus the EU, and we all had to come to some consensus on what is the definition of inclusive business. And so we came up with, an, uh, with a framework. So this is the approach to inclusive business. I'm gonna go very quickly through here because I think there are important points on this kind of definition. One is that we wanted to separate the type of um, relationship between the business and the low-income communities. And this is a business, so we wanted to clarify what were the expected financial returns or no expected financial returns. And as a business, you need to get funding. So we wanted to identify what kind of funding for each type of, uh, uh, of these, what we call the framework. So the first one, the one that I have seen knows really well, we called it inclusive business models. The relationship between the company and the low-income community or low-income people is that they are part of the core value chain. The financial return expectation for our investment in a company that does inclusive business models is the market return for that sector in that country. And the funding that we provide is of commercial level return. You know, International Finance Corporation is part of the World Bank Group, but when we finance private sector, we do it at the market rate. Now, the second type is what we call inclusive business activities. These are activities often by multinational companies that want to either because they, in that one country they're in, they want to show that they really have a commitment, um, but it's not 100% of the business. So we're calling it as an ancillary activity. Now, when you're a big company and you try to do a value chain with smallholder farmers, you may not at the very beginning expect full commercial returns. So it could be the expectation that you're gonna get your money back, which is almost like just saying, well, we're not gonna make the full, you know, 10% that we expect of other projects, but, you know, we're gonna break even. Or they could say for the first five years, we're, we, we will be okay with a less than market return. This is after talking to many multinational companies and seeing how they finance these activities. So the primary funding type, usually we say commercial because it's from the company itself. So it is not as if they're getting a grant or some kind of subsidy from the outside. And the final and very important point, especially here, is that we include social enterprise initiatives as part of inclusive business. Because when you first start out, you don't really know where you're going to end up. And you know, it could be something that's an ancillary or a core to, to the social enterprise. But the one different thing is that many social enterprises are not maximizing profit. They may want a return. They may want to be able to cover all their costs. Um, Professor Yunus' definition of social business is that you have to cover all your costs and you can maybe take 10%. So it varies according to different players. But here we're talking about um, an entity that can get funding from mixed sources. Sometimes it's philanthropy, fund foundations, government, or sometimes they can get some commercial money, but with a lot of grants for the capacity building. So this was kind of the compromise that UNDP, IFC, and other international organizations came up with that was accepted by the G20. And I feel that there's room for everybody here. Let's face it, the problem is huge, so we need everybody to help. But we created at least a framework that fits in many of the players that we see. And, uh, and we hope that you know, we can perfect this or, or be a little more precise, but this just gives you an idea 
that there are many players out there, there are many types of funding, there are many types of goals, but if we are at the end of the day trying to help poor women and poor men who happen to live in a community that have no access to finance, that have no access to services, and a company or a social enterprise wants to help, it is, it is an inclusive business. So this being kind of like the, the crux of what we really fought for for many months, uh, and then and Marcus is here to attest to that, um, we were able to convince the G G20, and so the next steps on the G20 roadmap is that they have agreed that we will explore a platform. Um, it's called a G20 inclusive business platform, but it really is to look at what policies exist out there. And it's not easy. Within the World Bank Group, I tried to find policies that are both pro-poor and pro-private sector, and they are not labeled that way, because this is a new concept. And so we have to really go through many layers to find out exactly what policies actually help um, inclusive business. Having said that, the majority of the inclusive business clients we have have not had any help from any kind of subsidies or anything from the government, and they are successful. So I don't think that the policy makes the inclusive business. It is more that future policy may be able to help more inclusive businesses come up but you know, it's not a deterrent, but I think it's a good place to start and have a dialogue. And then the, the second thing we promised to the G20 is to come up with a much harder evidence base. We do have a lot of case studies, but you know, we probably only have a certain percentage of our 400 you know, um, clients that we did case studies with, so that's one more thing. So you know, it, it is not as if we cannot do it, we know it can be done. Um, I think that that is the most important thing to leave this room today, understanding that at least from IFC's uh, evidence base, 400 companies have done it. I'm sure there are thousands of companies that have done it. It's just that we, they don't even know that they're doing inclusive business. So it's for all of us here that are already converted to go out and really talk about inclusive business, find out if people are doing it, find out if a medium-sized company is doing it, a small company is doing it, but make it so that this becomes what is normal. We have to change the mind frame, and we just have to go about it saying, you know, in the future, all companies are going to have an aspect of inclusiveness, because that, that is what we all have to do. Um, I think that I've been in, in development work, but in the private sector side of development, and really meeting all the clients that do inclusive business is the most amazing thing because these are really businessmen. They are really thinking about their business, they're thinking about their legacy, they're thinking about leaving a company for the next uh, generation that they can be proud of. And amazingly in Europe, many larger companies are actually doing inclusive business. That's one of the things that they tell us is, we need to have this kind of a company to recruit better people to come into our companies. Because young people nowadays really want to work for a company that has a purpose that they can be proud of. So I think that this is the future. Uh, I'm really very grateful that I have met so many very wonderful leaders who, have, who are ahead of their time, but I think this is the path to the future. I think that many, many companies will do this. This is, for inclusive business right now, it's still at the earlier stages, it's what sustainability was 10, 15 years ago. And eventually everybody's going to say, okay, what are you doing in terms of your core business and really being able to reach the poor? Okay, in conclusion, I'm just gonna give you, I think that the slides will be available on the website, so this is the kind of uh, publications that we have done at IFC. Um, there are lots of publication, but one thing I wanted to share with you is that we did a global consumption database last year, and this is all the household data that the World Bank gets from governments we were able to work with our World Bank colleagues to make it so it's very easily be searchable. 
And for two countries that are large, Brazil and South Africa, it's actually done at the state level. And you can find out what is the consumption of dairy in Colombia. And it will give you a breakdown in different kind of income segments, including the lowest segment. So this is just to, to share that, yes, there is not that much information, but we're all trying very hard to get the information so that people who are looking into working in a sector, you know, in a country, in Africa, and they want to get at least some idea of what is the household expenditure for that item, they can actually go in and you can download it and into Excel and, and, and work, uh, you know, on your own. So that's, that's one contribution that we were able to make because we are part of the World Bank group and we said, okay, this, this really makes sense. And then we do have our 40 plus case studies. There are only two pages, so it's just kind of a summary of what the business model is about. Thank you so much. I am so delighted to have been able to share, you know, this little journey that I've had personally in inclusive business. And I really do hope that we are all going to together reach an even better goal.